Welcome. Um, update, as Stefan said, um, to what's happening in TLC and tips how you can make TLC go a little bit faster. Um, combat the state space explosion. <clears throat> That's why I say it's an uphill battle. So I don't have any fixes to the state space explosion problem. Um, and I don't foresee TLC going significantly faster and compete with um, a set based model checker for numbers like 81. <clears throat> um, before that, I have to make a quick announcement because there is a new version out today. Um, coincidence. Um, <clears throat> there is a change log on GitHub, a very detailed one this time, where we have screencasts of the new features, also the features on the toolbox and so on and so on. And you see, I prepared this talk early in advance when I saw this table here. So this is us here sitting in the boardroom, war room. Yeah, um, and the tutorial is obviously based on the features that are um, present in the new TLC version 2.13. Okay, just to quickly recap, the state space explosion problem, we all know what it is um, pretty quickly with a linear increase in the size of the specification or the properties that one wants to check um, the number of states explodes. Um, that's really... It can be much more than exponential. Pardon? It can be more than exponential. Okay, um, but we all agree that it explodes, right? <laughs> um, and exemplified here on this Q spin lock um, specification, which comes out of ARM and is, yeah, it's a spin lock um, thingy. I just plotted it for the values one, two, three, and four. Um, and with one process, it takes seven states, and with two processes, it's already at 1,000 states, and then it goes up pretty quickly, and also model checking goes from one second to days. This took like four days or so. I don't know if you ever verified it for... No. So, yeah, I verified it for four processes, but I had to use symmetry reduction, which is something I will talk about later, and I used a 32-core machine on the Amazon cloud. Yeah, there is no point in having a spin lock for one process, and that's why it only has seven states, right? So it acquires a lock and it's done. <clears throat> um, generally, TLC has these two modes. Um, the primary mode is checking safety properties, which can also be done in a depth-first search, um, iterative deepening way. But the default, again, is breadth-first search over the on-the-fly generated state graph. And this is really fast and um, kind of successful. There's also this liveness checking, which takes much longer, um, which unfortunately requires depth-first search, even nested depth-first search to find the strongly connected components. And uh, it has to check a larger graph. So liveness checking is really more difficult. Um, and this translates to the following data uh, structures in TLC that we need to be aware of for today's tutorial. So first we have, TLC has this so-called fingerprint set um, where it stores the scene states to keep track of what it's what is already done. And it has the state queue, obviously, where it stores all the unexplored states after it evaluates the next state relation. From some given state, it generates successor states, and all of them end up in the queue until they are picked again. We have this trace file um, or trace data structure with which TLC recreates um, the error trace out of the um, fingerprint path. So when TLC finds a violation of a safety property, um, it just has the fingerprint path um, to this error state, so we have to rerun model checking, but this time guided so that we quickly follow um, the correct, correct path. Um, and then we obviously have a set of workers um, that run um, our safety checking. If we do liveness checking, it's just one worker, at least to find the strongly connected component, and our safety properties, just for the sake of completeness. And if this fingerprint set um, runs out of memory, then is what, uh, then you see what Andrew calls this IO bound death graph, drastic language here, but um, the disk activity at some point really goes to 100 
and the CPU activity goes to 3%. Um, so then you're really I.O. bound. This is really drastic here because it's an Amazon machine, an Azure machine, one of the smaller ones where the disk I think is connected remotely over a, probably a small, uh, slow network. Um, but nevertheless, you always see um, the number of states being generated um, go down the moment you hit the memory limit for the fingerprint set. It's not the problem so much for the state queue. The state queue is permanently written to disk, um, but that's not the problem because we only keep a few pages of the head of the queue and a few pages of the um, tail of the queue in memory and constantly and asynchronously write it to disk. So it's just the fingerprint set, and that's why we dedicate 75% or so to the fingerprint set to keep this in memory. Um, no, there's a built-in hash function. What you can do, you can select the seed that goes into the hash function, but that's it. Because say in Spin, you can choose between different hash functions. Sometimes you can even say, I have one bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, in uh, TLC, it's fixed to 64-bit, and it's becoming too small. So nowadays, TLC is fast enough to actually check the complete fingerprint space. Um, so at some point, we have to switch to 128. Uh, bits, and I'm still waiting for I think what's called value types um, being available in the um, Java VM. Um, is there an update when they will be included? Okay, soon. soon. <laughs> I've been hearing this for a while now. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there are a few low-hanging few, few fruits that you can pick um, if you want to speed up large-scale model checking. Especially if you run it on a single machine, for me, TLC doesn't really crash anymore regularly. So just disable checkpointing, don't pay the overhead for checkpointing. And also if you check a large model um, and you know that you, the coverage is already satisfactory for your specification, just collect coverage information at a very slow rate. Yeah, um, because um, there is no point in maintaining this kind of information. Something that has been introduced more recently compared to the previous two is um, this feature to defer or postpone liveness checking. Um, I don't know if you're using this already, Stefan, but when you say two hours go into liveness checking, it's probably one and a half hours to check the complete state graph, then, uh, no, that's too much, but um, they sum up, right? So TLC runs a steps for search and it runs it periodically on the partial state graph. Um, first, it's really fast because we just check 1,000 or a couple of thousand states, um, but we do this over and over again, and it's not done incrementally. So we always start from scratch. And then one of the example specs, without um, doing periodic liveness checking, TLC finished in two hours, and with periodic liveness checking, it finished in two hours 40. And if you use this add and check final or this um, button here in the toolbox, um, TLC will only check um, liveness at the end of model checking, which is probably good enough if you know that for smaller models, the specification um, adheres to the liveness properties. And you just want to verify that um, a larger specification um, is also correct. Okay. At runtime, you normally don't have much control about TLC. You just start it off and then sit in front of the toolbox and wait for um, status to come in. Um, there is this interface um, called JMX, Java Management Extension or something like that, um, which, is, which first exposes lots and lots of telemetry data about the JVM, the Java machine, that's not too interesting. But the toolbox and the TLC itself also exposes a bunch of um, telemetry data, um, like the number of states generated and so on and so on, and its version number. <coughs> and um, a so-called inspection hatch, which allows you to look at the head of the state queue. So every once in a while, you might want to see if TLC is still producing uh, new states or if it's stuck or something like that. Um, then you connect this um, Java Mission Control thing or any other JMX um, client to the VM 
and you immediately can see what TLC is working on. And it also export, exposes um, these operations that I just suggested to generally disable. You can now trigger them manually. And just so you see it, uh, we have this mission control here. Let me just fire up um, the TLC process. Then it runs for a while. There it is. And this Java mission control is part of the uh, JDK installation. So you don't have to install anything. So here's telemetry information, CPU usage, looks good. And we switch over here and expose this model checker and bean. We see this inspection hatch. Um, so we can look uh, over TLC, TLC's shoulder and we can also uh, execute operations such as finger uh, uh, checking and checkpointing. And technically, we should see TLC down here, take a snapshot in a minute or so. But let's not wait for, wait for that. Does it include some overhead in this case, JMX principle? No, there's no, well, JMX is generally there. So um, obviously if you pull in the state queue all the time by hitting F5 really fast, then you acquire a lock on the state queue. Um, but if you just occasionally look at it, it's not a problem. So it doesn't pull the states constantly, it just pulls them um, when you reload. Okay, been to that. Um, another low hanging fruit is obviously to increase this number of worker threads here on the main uh, model checker page. By default, it is set to half of your machine's core count conservative estimation because we assume that you want to do other tasks such as reading email or mining Bitcoin. Um, <clears throat> the drawback is if you increase this or if you use more than one single um, worker thread is that the search obviously deviates from strict um, breadth-first search. So there's a ch chance that you find that you don't find the shortest error trace um, but you only get an approximation of the shortest error trace, which is usually off by one or two states. So it's not such a big deal if we're talking about error sta traces that are 30 or 100, 150 states long, who cares? How does the, the thread divider work? Oh, just by popping um, states from the state queue. So you have one global state queue and all the workers pick pop states from the state so, queue. So why is it not breadth first? Because you have have one worker that goes to the next level on already and another worker that is at a previous level but hasn't fully explored the state yet finds and, and the one that is at the next level finds the invariant violation first. So is it really one, one by one state or is it just allocate some blocks in between? Um, well, in distributed mode, it, it's um, batches of states or blocks and then um, parallel TLC, it's just a single state. I also experimented with multiple, but with batches again, but I didn't see a big improvement. You just hold the locks longer, so. So the parallel mode, could you just, could you hang on, you find a violation, could you hang on until all the other workers are exploring something which is at least further down? Probably, yes, yeah. If, if you were um, wanted. There's also this mode in TLC, if you pass the minus continue flag, um, which doesn't work inside the toolbox, but with which TLC just continues once it's found an inv invariant violation. So it keeps going and finds the next one and so on and so on. Um, but that just works with the command line version of TLC. Um, but again, it's not a big deal to find just the approximation. <clears throat> we have a prototype um, of TLC that scales a little bit better. TLC got written 20 years ago and under the assumption that you have like four to eight cores. Four cores do next state exploration or evaluation of the next state relation. One core adds something into the fingerprint set, the other one adds something to the state queue or pops something on the state queue, and the third one writes something into the trace. So that's a good enough model for 20 years ago. Nowadays with 128 cores, uh, this, doesn't, this model doesn't hold anymore. So <clears throat> we now have a fingerprint set that is uh, once partitioned and is also lock free. So that really scales nicely, um, scales up to 128 cores. The next 
the TLC release will have um, one trace per worker, so the prototype will be integrated um, in, into the next release for the trace. And what's still open is, can we use this shared nothing design for the state queues so that you have n state queues for n workers? That obviously scales perfectly. Um, I don't think the assumption is correct that all the state graphs are well shaped so that you have great branching. Pardon? What if you use fork join pool for that? Um, I haven't looked into the um, into the pools. It's just a question of can you partition somehow partition the state graph? Because the way it works, is, so we're stealing scheduler. So if if one worker generates an X thread, it will go to its own queue. So it's there's no locking, no sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, but if one of the workers runs out of things to do, it's going to steal a task, in this case, a state from one of the other workers. But where do you insert the new states that you produce? In your own queue. Yeah, but then other friends can steal them. So yeah, but it's always bound. Mm -hmm. that, that works, um, but then we are again moving away from um, bread first search, right? Um, so if we are really moving away from bread first search, then just use a set, right? Pop states at random from it. Then you don't care about the length of the error trace anymore. But I agree there is some in between here and fork join might be something um, that can be adopted. I also looked into what, what spin does. Um, with the shared nothing design at least and this prototype, we can outperform spin in terms of scalability. So this uh, black line here, this is us, red is spin, spin by default just goes to 64 state uh, uh, cores. Um, I ran these numbers um, through Holtzman and he confirmed them more or less. He said the next thing he's going to do is to work on scalability and spin because also it goes down here, right? So the more cores you add with a spin, um, it gets slower. And that's fortunately something that we don't yet see in TLC. And generally the numbers were taken on a machine with 128 uh, Amazon compute cores. And this doesn't mean 128 physical cores. I think the actual number of physical cores is around 70. It's, I think this line here, the started line. So I would like to repeat the experiment again on even larger machines and see how far um, TLC can scale. To be fair, spin is still orders of magnitude faster when it comes to evaluate the next state relation. Right? It's compiled down to C, whereas TLC is just this interpreter. <clears throat> but let's see if we can make the next state relation a little, a little bit faster. Let's consider this uh, toy specification here where we have this operator that, that happens to be named expensive operator, which has one parameter and which chooses an element from um, from the subsets of the interval one to n, just any one of it. And then we have two ways on, and have two variables, x and y, both get assigned with zero, doesn't really matter much. Um, we have these two ways to write the next state relation. So is it preferable to use next a or is it preferable to use next b? Quick show of hands, yeah? or, or doesn't it matter? Okay, record it. <laughs> well, there is um, this feature or this um, operator called TLC set and TLC get that is part of the TLC standard module. And the way it works is that you can store some information um, for TLC to look it up later. And we can use this hack here to count the times um, how, how often this exp expensive op here gets called. Um, and then we just print it in as part of the next state relation. Um, and for next A, you see this counter goes up, so expensive op gets evaluated over and over and over again. And the way that TLC prints it is actually expensive of one, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, expensive of two, and then again five seconds. And for next B, where expensive op is moved um, up above the x in 1 to um, 10,000, it's just evaluated once. That's some, something people have to be aware of. Because the choose here 
because you have this in here, or actually you have this in here, so 10,000 times it runs expensive up. Okay. So it's really clever. <laughs> but that's something you have to be with. Even though, even though X prime is not used in the next yeah. in that expression. Yeah. Well, you can run it yourself. Um, but X prime is not used in the next expression. It's still going to evaluate it 10,000 times? What, what are you saying? So X prime, so in X A or, or B, X yeah. prime is X prime. Even though it's not used here, it's still evaluated 10,000 times. So I killed this after several minutes, and this takes 10 seconds. TLC could be made a bit more clever, obviously. Um, and for some things, we do it. Also, choose something from subset something doesn't necessarily require to enumerate the complete subset. Um, but still, you don't want to evaluate uh, your exp expensive operator 10,000 times. Um, quick detour, if you have large amount of data that come out of, of print and print T, because you're calling it as part of the next state relation maybe, um, the toolbox isn't really written to handle gigabytes or megabytes even of, of output, so you can um, redirect the output to this user file and then the control information that the toolbox requires still goes to the toolbox and the print and print T goes to this extra file and uh, the toolbox doesn't slow down TLC. Okay, getting back to our order of expression here, the same model that uh, module that has TLC get and TLC set has also TLC eval. And the documentation says something along the lines of eager evaluation. So, perfect, right? That's exactly what we want. Eagerly evaluate expensive op, even though it's um, called 10,000 times doesn't work. Um, the reasons for TLC eval seem to have been lost in time. Um, it just eagerly evaluates sets and function records anyway, so it doesn't eagerly evaluate this operation here. So I would, to evaluate a set, I would have to nest it in around the uh, subset 1 to n. But even then it doesn't work. So it should work if you have lets and recursive functions, but I couldn't come up with an example where it really helped um, speed up the next set relation. If either of you has, has found a useful uh, scenario for TLC eval, please come to me. <coughs> Another thing is constant folding. So we have the specification here, an excerpt of the specification where we repeatedly call um, index of some fingerprint. And the specification specifies if the size of some table or some constant here is happens to be a power of two, then we can do bit shifting, otherwise we have to do this costly arithmetic and calculate something. So because k is a constant, it's clear that how many times does it have to be evaluated? Once, right? When TLC starts up. Again, doesn't work. TLC evaluates it each and every time. Um, index is, is evaluated. So we have human constant folding in TLC. You have to move this out of uh, your index operator and make it a constant, Some, something like a constant. So it's an upper, a parameterless operator. If this has a parameter, it doesn't work. That's one way how we could have fixed expensive up, right? We could have removed the N here and then could have gone um, away with it. Sure, yeah, no. Sure. This can also be found by right. just uh, being more clever when it comes to evaluate the next state relation. It's not rocket science, right? Yeah. Um, it's really straightforward left to right evaluation. Um, there's another thing to handle the skates, um, which are so-called module overrides, um, with which you can implement a TLA operator in Java. And this is done for almost all standard modules. I tried to turn off the um, TLC module overriders op uh, overrides for the standard module, and TLC wouldn't work anymore. So <laughs> by now, it's sufficiently dependent on the standard modules. 
but in theory it should work without the standard modules. It only works for TLA plus operators and yeah, you can really shoot yourself in the foot, right? That's why I try to depict it with this particular so image here. Hmm? Pardon? What do you mean only works for TLA plus operators? So you cannot fiddle with the next state and assign something to the next state or variables, so prime variables. Um, <clears throat> that's what I mean with TLA plus operators. <clears throat> One interesting hack is to use um, module overrides. Once you have sufficient confidence in your specification to selectively override operators and then use these operators, move these operators into your implementation. Because it's almost like a unit test, except that the input space is much larger because you use it with TLC and not using JUnit tests or unit tests in general where you do 1 to 10 and that's it, right? Um, and for example, this index function here um, it's, is the index function of the um, log-free fingerprint set that is written or implemented in TLC now. And I actually use this approach to move the TLC module override into the TLC implementation later on. And we could also use it for this um, choose E. And the way it's done is that if the specification is, is called contrived example, the class has to be in the default namespace and has to have a matching name. And the same goes for the operator we try to override. And then we have to have a matching number of, of values. And we return a value here. And I even use more specific type. So there, is, there are TLC types. Um, if you want to use a uh, module override, you obviously have to set up a Java project inside um, your IDE of choice, and then um, add the TLA2 tools jar to the um, library path. And then you get access to int value and value, and you have to know how to map uh, the TLA um, parameters to the actual TLC parameters. In this particular case, I know it's an int, right? So it's an int value. And then I just seed some random number generator, pick a number between 1 to n, um, and randomly select n elements um, from the interval without ever um, enumerating the subset. <clears throat> Another example where I think module overrides can pay off is if you have this rather complex invariant here, because this gets evaluated for each and every state, right? And I have this table here, again, it's a hash table. And I want to make sure that there are no duplicates. Um, first, this let here, the first line discards of the special value that represents empty. And then I have this naive uh, way of checking if there are duplicates by selecting the first element, checking all the others, then the next one, checking all the others, and so on. It's perfectly fine for a specification. I don't want to come up with a nifty algorithm here to check for duplicates. I probably get it, get it wrong. And then my invariant just, is just bogus. But why not override it with a module override um, once I have sufficient confidence? And the previous one was more like n squarish. This is now the clever variant that is just linear. I, I, I allocate an array and then just check, check if one element appears uh, multiple times. <clears throat> but if you plot the data throughput here, so more is better, then we have without module overrides here and only already two orders of magnitude faster is um, a variant of the module override that still uses um, this n squarish um, algorithm, so a one-on-one -on -one mapping of the um, TLA plus operator. And if I optimize it to the linear one, again, get five times speed up because the table is so small, just 10 or 15 elements. It's not such a drastic difference here, but you really see from going from here to there, it's two orders of magnitude. Fortunately, they, they can't plot logarithmic scales here. That's why this blue line is uh, hardly noticeable. OK, <clears throat> so now we've looked into uh, making the next state relation or evaluation of the next state relation be faster. Now you might want to look into um, scaling the next state relation, evaluating it in parallel. We have parallel TLC, we've seen it earlier. 
we also have distributed TLC where you can run um, on a network of computers or network of machines and instances of TLC. And its scalability characteristics are kind of nice, satisfactory, if you have simple states, meaning that if you have a gazillion variables with nested and nested and nested data structures, the cost of serialization will go through the roof, right? Um, and then you, at some point, just overwhelm your, ma your machines and they just do serialization all the time. How, how does it work? How are they distributed the work? They have this uh, master node here, which keeps track of the centralized state queue. It's obviously a single point of failure and it's a bottleneck, but the workers, so the nodes that are not the master, just pop query the master for um, unexplored states. They get a batch of state. They get a batch of states. Back then, I actually wrote um, a framework so you can provide your own JavaScript uh, function to select states. Um, by default, um, it measures. I think it measures the time and tries to optimize itself to um, select the good size, batch size. Um, and then it explores all these states and sends the result back to the master node, the new unexplored states, and also adds um, the fingerprints of the known states then to the fingerprint set. Uh, what's not supported by distributed TLC is liveness checking. Well, it doesn't scale on a single computer. It obviously also doesn't scale on a network of computers, unfortunately. And what's probably the most limiting factor here is it's really difficult to set up. So you have this technician here in front of this control board who monitors all these machines here who extend the fingerprint set to the tape drives. Um, it's really difficult. Yet there's good reason to use um, distributed TLC because we learned earlier that the moment that TLC goes to disk, in the rate at which states get um, explored halves or even goes down more significantly. Um, <clears throat> and even solid state disks don't really solve this. Um, but it turns out that remote memory is still um, surprisingly fast. It's not as fast as local memory, but assuming you have a fast enough network and you don't do geo-distributed model checking, um, you can really use this distributed hash table um, approach to combine yeah, the collective memory of all the nodes into one big finger logical fingerprint set, um, which yeah, is this distributed hash table shard of fingerprint set space, so to speak. And this is a separate mechanism from distributing work. It's just an extra feature. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we have technically three roles in distributed TLC. One is the master role, the worker role and the distributed fingerprint set role. And workers can be uh, fingerprint sets, so it makes sense to combine this. Doesn't make sense to use, to assign the master other nodes, roles such as uh, from the other two. So the master is a bottleneck, so try to reserve some compute performance for, for the task of the master. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the question pretty quickly comes up, what's a good machine to run distributed TLC on? Um, what knobs do I have to, to turn? Well, that's something I don't want you to think about. Um, even figuring out where you get most bang for your buck when it comes to selecting um, instances from the various instance types at Amazon, that's really way too complicated. Um, the answer to that is to use Cloud TLC, what has been dubbed by me Cloud TLC. That's a push button solution to model checking in the cloud. Um, so far, it has support for Azure and AWS, but it's not difficult to extend it to other clouds. It uses the JClouds API, and it also just uses the very um, minimal primitives provided by all cloud APIs compute. So we just need to start a computer and stop it. That's all that we need and the rest is just done by SSH. And you really, it really hides away all the uh, idiosyncrasies of TLC 
and the cloud platform. You only have to generate your credentials once manually, and that's it. Otherwise, you don't see the cloud platform. It supports, obviously, single node TLC and distributed TLC, and can be started from the toolbox. And what's especially nice about this, it is um, that you can run multiple models concurrently. So far, I think the default mode of operation is you specify something, then you hit run, you sit in front of your computer and wait for TLC to finish. Maybe it takes a day, so you go home and do something else. And then you come back, and then you find an error, and then you fix the error, and then again, um, repeat this process. If you have the cloud, well, let's scale, let's be elastic. So just run several instances of TLC in parallel and explore variants of your, um, of your specification. So when I say it's push button, let's see if it's really push button. So we won't need this guy here anymore. So here's my toolbox. And now well, this happens also to be this hash table specification here. And on the main model page, I just expand this how to run section where you normally increase uh, the number of worker threads and the memory that gets assigned. And you select from this drop down list here that you want to run a distributed mode. If you select this ad hoc here, then you have this basic distributed TLC where you have to launch the workers yourself. Um, but I'm going to run it on uh, um, Amazon now and click run. And now it takes uh, whatever it takes Amazon to, to spin up an instance. So now at least we've gotten to the point that the Amazon API has answered and it wants to start this uh, C3.8 extra large instance, which costs a few euros uh, an hour um, in this US East region. Um, I just selected the region uh, where the instance prices are the cheapest because the amount of data that gets sent back and forth between the toolbox and the cloud is just minimal. It's just a few megabytes, right? So it doesn't matter if it's on the north or south pole and we are on Mars. Um, but yeah, this is going to take now for a few minutes. Um, and I've shown this earlier. Um, eventually, once it's done starting the instance, which is a little bit faster on, on Amazon than it is on Azure, it installs everything that's uh, required by TLC. Um, most importantly, Java, and afterwards it just runs TLC. And then uh, you have this fire and forget uh, methodology or idea uh, <clears throat> where you can keep this running on the cloud, you shut down the toolbox, take your computer and walk home. Um, <clears throat> in the new toolbox release, um, the spin up time. Um, um, was reduced from minutes to seconds, provided that you started a previous instance. So now the toolbox can reuse um, instances that are already done, checking the previous model, and then it doesn't start up a new instance, it just uses recycles of the old one, and that means that the startup boot time here to initialize model checking goes down from minutes to just seconds, 10 seconds or so, and this is why I think it becomes feasible to repeatedly run Cloud TLC even on smallish models. Well, if model checking just, just takes a minute, then there's no, a second, then there's no point to do this. Um, but if it's 10 minutes or so, you might want to reduce it to one minute by using it on a machine with 32 cores. And like I said, it's also possible um, to run several models in parallel. There is no limit except your credit card. Um, and fortunately, and hopefully, if the code is more or less correct, they will dispose automatically. So if you use this feature, I suggest to occasionally check if there are <laughs> hundreds of um, instances running and uh, the next credit card bill is rather going to be large. Um, but the idea is that after 10 minutes, um, they just um, dispose, terminate automatically. And if you just restart model checking within this time, um, you can just reuse it. And the way it's implemented, so now this is done here, um, provisioning, starting, starting the instance. Um, first of all, on this new release, we now get to see the output. Ah, I think I have somewhere a window open this year that wants to take me to this website. 
that um, is hosted by this instance where you also get telemetry. That's not um, of interest today because we can go to this console here, TLC console, and see the output of the remote instance. Ah, I think I've set it to check a liveness property. That's trivial. Um, we see here in the snapshots, which is also rather newish, so that you have these snapshots here um, below a model where previous runs are uh, kept for you, so you can look at them again. You have the special item here that identifies an instance that's still running. And in theory, uh, we can just terminate this instance here. And once this remote call goes through, um, TLC should be done with it. And we then switch to the master model. <clears throat> it should, in theory, recycle the instance. Yeah. So it skipped the complete startup and provisioning step and just uploads the not so new specification. But it could also be a variant of the specification, right? Now, this is this web output that you get, so you can also look at it from the browser if you want to. But now, nowadays, it's also available inside the toolbox. <clears throat> um, you can also launch Cloud TLC from the command line if you want to automate this. Um, this might be useful. For example, if you want to combine your check-ins of your program code with running the model checker again, then you can use this approach here. Let's not, uh, let's not go over the details here, just for the sake of completeness. We also use it to um, periodically run TLC on a bunch of specification benchmarks to get some kind of performance baseline. Um, it's quite useful. And also what would you get out of it is something that is called a Java flight recording. That's an almost no overhead uh, profiling, uh, recording of a profiling. They claim it's just 1% or so that, of overhead. And it has all the telemetry data about the JVM and TLC, the metrics that we expose, the TLC metrics that we expose. And if you want to, you can again use this Java mission control that I showed earlier to look at the, um, in this TLC JVR, JVR recording and try and figure out what, what went wrong, where TLC spent its time. <clears throat> I guess not too many people will, can make sense out of uh, the stack traces and all the performance numbers that they see. That's something that I'm mostly interested in. So if you use this cloud integration and you have no use for your Java flight recordings, please send them to me because I can analyze them and draw some conclusions of where TLC can be improved. And it doesn't share your specification. So that's just telemetry data. Um, then beyond scaling the next state relation, we can obviously uh, try to reduce the number of states that have to be checked. First of all is we can you, view, you, you, no, use views that way around <laughs> um, to exclude variables um, from the state space exploration. Um, you just have to provide the, um, the expression where you include the states that you want to be checked and tell TLC to apply the view with a minus view parameter that you um, insert on the advanced page of the model editor. It obviously only works for auxiliary variables. If you exclude interesting variables, yeah, then you're not checking what you should check. Read specifying system to make sure that you understand what you're doing, but it might be useful to you to reduce the state space. Um, a more useful optimization is obviously um, symmetry reduction, which can has the potential to reduce your state space significantly. It does so by choosing representative states for which, uh, which then are only are the only ones that are checked. Mathematically speaking, these equivalence classes are called orbits. But I also have 
rather more practitioner oriented um, visualization of the state space of whoops, state space of this blocking queue here, thanks to Will, who enhanced um, the state space visualization. Uh, we now get the state space out of TLC, and in this particular one, I mark at least uh, the states who are just uh, non representatives of the actual representatives of yellow. So in the same special or same state space for the same for the same specification with symmetry, the yellow states would be gone because this just has C2 and this has C1 and C2 and C1 are both in the same symmetry set. So here again we have C2 and P1 and here we have C1 and P1. So we can discard C1, P2, P1. Same for this one above here and down below there's another one. So we reduce the state space from 16, sta 16 states to 12 states, which is quite nice. Um, <clears throat> that might not always work if your spec is not symmetric or your safety property is not symmetric, then I mean, if I, my safe, safety property refers to C2 and I exclude C2 from the state space, well, nothing good will come out of it. It's not supported by license checking. TLC accepts it, but it prints a warning. So hell will break loose if you use it. Um, and also there's a spark here. Symmetry reduction can have a negative effect on TLC. It's reported by Ron, um, which can be shown by this trivial specification here. So we have just one variable and have a constant and we assume that the size of the set has nine elements. And then the unit predicate is just assign x is assigned to any one of these uh, elements and the next state uh, relation is pretty much the same. So without symmetry we have nine states and with symmetry we have one state. Without symmetry it takes two seconds, maybe one. Huh? With, with symmetry where we have just one state, it took TLC 18 hours to get <laughs> started on the first state, um, after which I killed it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and that's something that cannot be parallelized. So um, that, that's not really a real world use case, right? What you normally have is um, you have several symmetry sets that are a little bit smaller, not nine elements. If you want to go beyond nine elements, you even have to tweak TLC, but usually you have smaller um, symmetry sets. But for each and every state, TLC has to enumerate all the variables times all the permutations of A or times all the permutations of B and so on and so on. This is really the overhead that you pay for symmetry reduction. So you trade compute for memory. If you want to stay uh, memory bound by reducing, by reducing the state space, you have to do extra work when you explore the next state relation. But the, the compute automatically I, mean, I didn't, I missed the first part. I mean, usually you compute some kind of representative state right? mm -hmm. uh, on the symmetry. So why does this sort of happen? This is exactly the uh, finding the representative. Okay. Okay. So that's, so symmetry reduction in TLC, you have to provide the symmetry manually. Mm -hmm. So you have to specify it manually. You could also try to detect it dynamically. Um, that's not implemented. But finding this representative um, is this part here. And this is considered rather difficult um, in the general case. So there might be ways to uh, find optimizations for it. Nobody has looked into it yet. Um, but yeah, symmetry, less memory, more compute, which is okay if you just scale it right. Um, and finally, what about unfeasibly large state spaces here? So we assign in it to be um, x to be something, some of the subsets from 1 to 500. Quick reminder, that's 10 to the power of 150. Um, the known universe, observable universe, has roughly uh, 10 to the power of 80 atoms. Um, let's assume the universe is a just giant model checker um, and it has 13 billion years um, already um, going on. So I think it's rather unfeasible for TLC to do this, but that's something we never ever would attempt to, to model check, right? Um, it would rather be written like this. 
you know, we have a type OK invariant where you say X is one of the subsets of, of 1 to 500. And hopefully TLC is clever enough to not enumerate it to um, evaluate this expression. Um, and your init would actually be um, some assignment to some empty set. Um, so somebody told me that there is a trick if you do um, proofs with TLAPS, you're interested in finding your inductive invariant or a strong candidate in a way of a high confidence that this is indeed um, an inductive invariant. And then you pull this trick that you make your supposed to be inductive invariant the initial predicate. And then this inf is usually this type OK plus some H here. H is, let's let it be the interesting part. And what TLC does, it first generates all the states defined by type OK and then throws those away that don't uh, adhere to the H. Um, that's rather unfeasible with 1 to 500. Um, but wouldn't it be great if there would be some kind of operator that just se selects um, the interesting sets and then we do probabilistic checking of our inductive invariant candidate so that we can then set out to prove it with TLAPS and really make sure that it is an inductive invariant. The new um, toolbox or the new TLC release has a new standard module that's called randomization. And there we have these two operators that don't necessarily pick the interesting um, sets and, and subsets, sets of subsets, but at least randomly selects um, elements from really, really large um, um, sets. And it doesn't have to, the implementation for most types, TLC types, is written in a way so that it doesn't explode. Um, and it turns out from experiments that even for rather small values of k here, so number of elements that you want to, that you get, um, you get a um, good feeling, a good um, sense, confidence in your inductive invariant. So if it's not an inductive invariant, um, this really, this way here, using random subset here, really helps you to, to find the violation for the inductive invariant. Um, Leslie is also going to uh, publish a note on how to use uh, TLC to check inductive invariants. That's pretty much here the condensed version of it. So read this note if you use TLAPS and please let us know um, how well this works. If, if it works for you, we'll likely implement a random set and random, random subset and random set of subsets for the remaining TLC types. And if you happen to run into one of the types that's not supported yet, then TLC will just take forever. Uh, oh, it's just integer again. No, it's just, it's um, interval value. Um, it's um, not integers, but you have um, subsets, so set enum functions, um, sets of sets, um, set functions, and so on. But for example, the union type, um, it's not something that you really see at the TLC, at the TLA plus level. Um, it's the built-in types into TLC for which it's not always implemented if we have support to draw a random um, selection of elements without enumerating it completely. But again, it's pretty detailed in this using TLC to check inductive invariance. I don't know if, it's, if it has been published yet. If it hasn't been published yet, it will come out in the next couple of days. Okay, to summarize, um, TLC is already highly tuned and it's difficult to squeeze out more performance. Um, even if you use module overrides for expensive op, it's really hard to see the effects and the number of states that get generated. Um, still try to reduce constant overhead if you um, check large models, don't do coverage, don't do checkpointing just do final liveness checking. Maybe eventually I want to reverse the default to always, by default to final liveness checking and periodic liveness checking only as an, um, on request. Reduce the cost of the next state evaluation by reordering your expressions. Use TLC set, TLC get to find out where, what's costly and what not. Always provide sufficient amounts of memory to your, to TLC. We have a few modules lying around. 
um, use them. Scale TLC in both directions by using parallel TLC and by using distributed TLC, which is really simplified by Cloud TLC. And don't shoot yourself in the foot with symmetry and uh, views. In the future, um, I will continue to focus on scalability, both in terms of parallel TLC and distributed TLC, TLC because the findings will pretty much, uh, it's likely that the findings will apply to both of them anyway. And for that, it's good if we get access to your specifications or support Igor's claim to, uh, or call to, to publish your specification. If you can't publish your specifications because of intellectual property reasons, then at least uh, share your flight recordings with us. And I promise that your specification doesn't get uh, encoded inside this flight recording here. Um, for liveness checking, we might have, um, or there's work in the pipeline to have a concurrent algorithm or implementation of a concurrent algorithm to search for strongly collected components. The results look promising, so at least get to use four cores instead of one. Maybe not 32, but um, we'll see. And if I personally blue sky here, then I could think of using this truffle Graal thingy, where one again is the expert for. Um, it's coming from the Java world, uh, where you can uh, could write a compiler for TLI plus, so to speak. So that would probably drastically speed up the evaluation of the next data relation. You don't have to or reorder your expressions manually anymore. And I've always wondered if machine learning um, can help us in the future to extract some knowledge out of TLC to tune it. For example, something that would be good to know is how large is the specification actually? Is it a small specification, is it a larger one? Um, especially if you rerun it repeatedly, right? So you run the first time, it's a small specification of just a few thousand states. TLC does all the optimizations to handle really large specifications, wastes some time at startup. Um, the next time you rerun it, it's probably safe to assume that it's a small specification again. So let's not, let's skip all the optimizations to handle large specifications. But we pretty quickly go into the direction of user data reporting, I guess, for, with machine learning. Um, so that's something that's rather scary for an open source project. Thanks.